6. Where last week we saw our Lord showing that a special group of people had been given to him by his Father way back in eternity, and that these people would be drawn to him and could never be lost and would be raised from the dead at the last day. But the Jews who listened to this were unmoved by Christ. They didn't believe that he'd come down from heaven. They knew of Joseph and Mary, and they totally rejected his divinity. And by doing that, they showed that they themselves were not drawn by God. For the way for people to receive eternal life is to believe on Christ in a saving way. Now we're going on from there this morning in verse 48, where the Lord says once more, I am the bread of life. As we've seen before, this is one of the several I am's that are found in John's Gospel. The others include, I am the light of the world, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the way, the truth and the life, and I am the vine. And all these I am's look back to that special day in the Old Testament when Moses appeared before the burning bush and God said to him that his name was the great I am. And so these statements of our Lord showed that he identified himself with the God of the Old Testament. Now we've already seen that Christ is similar to bread in certain aspects. He said that, I am the bread of life. And here he is showing that just like a person cannot live without food, so people will perish if they do not receive him. <clears throat> As people become better off, not so poor, so bread is deemed to be less important. But it was all important in Bible days. You read through the Old and the New Testament, bread was the main thing. If you got bread, that was, that was great. Nowadays, it's the sort of thing that you buy already cut and wrapped. It's a convenience food. Not so many people buy it in baker shops anymore because it's not important to most people, not that important. Few people eat bread just by itself or with butter on it. It's almost used as a side dish to the more important food. And so it is with our Lord Jesus the better off the people have become, the less interested they are in him. And they only like him conveniently wrapped, and he's no longer seen as that important. Wasn't this the problem with the Old Testament, when the Israelites in the wilderness took the manna for granted, and on one occasion, quite famous we know, they actually said, our soul loathes this light bread. So they didn't appreciate it. Now, Lord mentions the manner in verse 49 here, how that those people who ate it later died. So though it was special bread, it wasn't able to keep people alive forever, whereas Christ is the bread of life, so he is able to keep people alive forever. If you notice, the last word of verse 48 is life, and the last verse of verse 49 is dead. And Jesus is showing the difference that he gives people eternal life and will one day raise them up from this earth and take them to heaven. He's showing the big difference between earthly help and spiritual health. You see, in the wilderness, the Israelites were given earthly food and earthly help, and that was good, that was very good, but it didn't save their souls. And there are many people who are interested in politics, and they go on and on about things. They talk about the changes that they would make in society if they had their way. And sometimes I've said to people like that, that would only be a temporary solution. You can do this, that and the other for people, but they still have to die. Why do that for people that's only gonna help them for a few years why not concentrate on that which will help them throughout eternity? But of course they're not interested in that because they don't believe in eternity. They think that death is the end of you. 
and that the gospel is merely offering you pie in the sky when you die. Uh, a very fine Christian man once said, I like pie and I look forward to getting some when I die. Now you can get the same problem with some churches as you do with politics. They want to help people socially, but nothing else. They preach a social gospel. They believe only in helping people physically, giving them earthly bread, if you like, but they do nothing for the soul. They do nothing so as to make men and women right with God and prepare them for eternity. Now, of course, the church should help people with their earthly needs, and it certainly does, but that's not its chief calling, no more than it was Christ's chief calling to feed people miraculously with loaves and fishes. That was just a sideline from his main work of saving lost men and women and making them right with God. If you want the main reason why Christ was on the earth, there it is written on our wall. Christ Jesus came into the world, what for? To save sinners. But he did also help people with their earthly needs. Indeed, he did more for them than anybody else. And so our Lord here is trying to lift the minds up of these people to a higher realm. They looked to him as somebody who could meet their physical needs, but they didn't see him as somebody who could save their souls. They wanted to receive help like those who obtained the manna, but Christ wanted them to believe on him as their saviour. They wanted ordinary bread, which gave them only temporary relief, but he wanted to give them eternal life so that they would go to heaven. And this is a great hope that God has put into every Christian's heart, a living hope, a certain hope, that based on the promises of God and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we should enjoy eternal life in heaven. The unbeliever, on the other hand, has got nothing to look forward to. They dare not think too far into the future. Some of them think forward to their old age and they save up and take out insurances and pensions and so on for what at best is only a handful of years at the end of their life. But they're never prepared for eternity. How about yourself? Are you prepared for eternity? And so our Lord repeats himself in verse 51. He says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. You people may not believe that I came down from heaven, but I did. And he further says here that he came down so that people should live forever. If any man eats of this bread, he will live forever. What an amazing statement to make. What a great claim to make. And each person has to ask themselves this morning, do I really believe what he says, or was he wrong? Or was he even telling a deliberate lie? Because he says that people through him can live forever. Forever. But he also says that this could only be the case if people actually eat the bread. And that's what this passage here is about this morning, and it's quite difficult. It's extremely important that we understand what he meant by that. The people who he was speaking to were offended by it. And what he was basically saying was this. If somebody's dying of starvation and you give them some bread, that's not going to help them unless they eat it. It is the receiving of the food, what is known as appropriating it, or taking it on board, or taking possession of it, consuming it, different words to say the same thing, that it's essential regarding food that you eat it. And so it is regarding your soul. Christ is the bread that can stop you dying spiritually, but if you don't receive him, if you don't eat this spiritual bread, if you don't feed on Christ, then he won't do you any good. And that's one of the main points of the Lord's Supper that by taking a little piece of ordinary bread, we are showing by faith what we are doing spiritually. We are appropriating Christ into our lives. We are feeding upon him. We are showing that our only hope of salvation lies in him being in our lives. You see, in the same way that there are people who just look at bread and admire it, so there are people who just look at Christ and admire him. 
there are people who analyse bread and there are those who analyse Christ. But the only way that bread can do people any good and that's by eating it. So it's with the Lord. You can listen to people on the internet telling you their opinions about him but a lot of these people are spiritually dead because they've not eaten Christ. They've not taken him into their lives. Now eating is unmistakably connected with appetite. If you're hungry, then you'll want to eat and those who are spiritually hungry, they will want Christ. In fact, they can't get enough of him. But the tragedy is that most people are not hungry for spiritual things, so they don't, desert, they don't desire the Lord. How hard it is to get little children to eat if it doesn't like the food. You have to coax it in all sorts of different ways. Sometimes stupid ways. Sometimes playing games with them. But you're just trying to get them to eat. You put the food on the spoon and you say to the child, this is an aeroplane, it's coming now. You've got to open your mouth and let the aeroplane come in and land. Or you pretend that you're eating it yourself. Oh, this tastes really lovely. You'll like this. It's... Or you promise them that if they eat the food, you'll give them a lovely sweet afterwards. All sorts of things are done to get over the fact that the child has got no appetite. And that's what many churches are doing today. Because we live in a generation where very few people have got any appetite for the things of God, they put on various things to try and coax people to come along and even make Christianity into some sort of a game or entertainment. They offer them all sorts of sweet things. But even if that works, they still have to face the fact that these people have got no appetite for the things of God. They've got no hunger and thirst after righteousness. They do not desire Christ and the things to do with him. Have you ever heard anybody say, I've, I've heard it countless times in, in evangelism, when I was young, I had religion rammed down my throat and I certainly don't want any more of it. What they are in fact saying without realising it is I had no appetite for Christian things and so I didn't want to take it in. It had to be forced on me. The person with real hunger doesn't argue about their food, they just get on and eat it. People pretend, pretend to themselves, that they don't receive Christ because of their intellectual reason. It goes right against all they've learned, they say. But that's not the real reason at all. They simply do not have any spiritual appetite. It's the same with those people who put, keep putting it off to the future. Sometime later in life, it shows they've got no appetite. They savour the things that be of man, but not the things that be of God. The things of this world taste lovely to them, but the things of God are sour to them. Some people see others feeding on Christ, but they're not. And everybody knows that watching other people eating doesn't help you relieve your hunger. Now our Lord also says in verse 51, the bread that I shall give is my flesh. And this is obviously speaking about his death on the cross. For he is showing that not only did he come down from heaven, but he came down to die. His flesh must be given, his body must be broken, his blood must be shed. He must die so that others could live. As he goes on to say, I will give my flesh for the life of the world. In other words, only by my death can sinner, sinners be saved. If Christ had lived a perfect life on earth, and that was all, we wouldn't be saved. He had to die. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. If on the Mount of Transfiguration, he descended back to heaven, we would have all gone to hell. But he stayed there so that he could not only do the will of God, but finish it. There was no other way to save men and women but him to die in their place. And this he did for people throughout the world, as it says here, not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. 
So in verse 52, we see the reaction of these people to all this. They thought he was being absurd. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They weren't on a spiritual wavelength at all. They were rather like Nicodemus when he said, how can a man be born when he's old? But they didn't all agree with each other. They strove amongst themselves. Maybe some suggested that they should get a clearer explanation from Christ, but others wrote him off completely. Some thought he was mad for saying such things. Others realised that a madman couldn't do those great miracles to benefit people. And so it's been over the last 2,000 years that people have striven with each other over the teachings of Christ, and yet only a few have received him. Now our Lord doesn't seem to answer the doubts of these people. He doesn't seem to explain what he means. Instead he repeats his statement in, in the next verse, verse 53, this time emphasising this glorious truth with the words, verily, verily. In other words, this is all important. And so it is, for he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Maybe they thought that this was even more ridiculous, even more extraordinary, but he was trying to tell them that only those who did accept his coming death as their way of salvation could be saved and go to heaven. But he doesn't make his statement simpler or easier to understand. He's even more spiritual in his words. And incredible as his words sounded, they were in fact true. A person will remain dead in trespasses and sins unless they receive him into their life. And he repeats this in verse 54. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's the fourth time now in these few verses that he's talked about raising people up at the last day. But how difficult it was for these ordinary people to understand. It can only be understood by faith. And this is pictured by our attendance at the Lord's Supper. When we take a little piece of bread and a small amount of wine and we consume this into our body, it's a picture of our doing what Christ is saying here, eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And this is done to show ourselves and other people and mainly to show God that what we believe is that by taking Christ into our lives we should be eternally saved. A Christian is somebody who's long since given up the idea of getting right with God through their own merits. They know that their only hope is through the body and blood of Christ as he was crucified for us. It should be obvious to anyone, even those who find this teaching extremely difficult, that our Lord is showing clearly <clears throat> that it's not sufficient just to believe on him. You have to take him into your life. You see, some people believe in Christ like they believe in Winston Churchill, Queen Victoria. <clears throat> they believe that these people were once on the earth, but that's all. They think that Christ lived and died and they acknowledge him as a person in history, but to them that's all there is to it. The teaching of the Bible is that Christ is alive, he's still alive, and only those who receive him into their life will themselves be raised from the dead. But unbelievers feel that all this is sheer nonsense. Why spend a half an hour listening to this? It's total nonsense, this man giving his flesh for us to eat. They don't believe in it at all. Now our Saviour is showing here that those who do have eternal life will show this by feeding upon him. Back in the book of Exodus, and we read it together, the Israelites were spared by the blood of the Passover the Lamb being sprinkled over their doorposts, but afterwards they fed on the same lamb. They were saved by the blood and then they ate the lamb. The lamb wasn't destroyed, they ate it up. And so it must be with the Christian. We're saved by the blood of the lamb and we continue to feed on the lamb after we've been saved. And that's why a person's interest in Christ and the things to do with him are an obvious evidence that they have eternal life and that they're on their way to heaven. In verse 55, our Lord says, 
for my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed. The word indeed meaning in the full sense. You may remember that he previously used this word when speaking about Nathaniel when he said that he was an Israelite indeed. Meaning to say in every sense of the word Nathaniel was more of a true Israelite than other people. And so it's the same here. The Christ's body is more of food than ordinary food. It is food indeed. It would keep you going a lot longer than other food. It will bring you through the storms of life. People can try to feed their souls on all sorts of things, but only Christ will bring real nourishment to them. And verse 56 yet again continues this theme of feeding on Christ. You know, the fact that our Lord has so much to say about eating in these verses could mean that he was thinking of man's original sin in the Garden of Eden because that was also connected with eating. Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit and that's what made us sinners in the first place. But now our Lord is showing that people can get rid of their sin by eating him, by receiving him into their life. Here he emphasises our union with him. We dwell with him and he dwells with us. And he's showing the fellowship that we can enjoy with him. It's almost as if he's saying that as we feed on him, he becomes part of us and we become part of him. I know this is very difficult to understand, but the food that we eat day by day throughout our lives, most of it passes through our body and helps our body to keep going. But some of the food actually becomes part of our body so that our bodies are made up of the food that we've eaten over the years. And if we can comprehend it, the same is true in a spiritual sense. That the more we take Christ into our life, the more he becomes part of our life. And just like our bodies are made out of the food that we've eaten, so our souls and our Christian lives are made out of Christ that we've taken in. And so we are part of him and he is part of us. We've often thought about Paul's favourite words of being in Christ, in Christ. And that's similar to what it's saying here. We are in him. We become part of him. We're told elsewhere that the Lord is like a rock. And in a time of storm, we can hide in that rock like hiding in a cave. So the rain and the storm falls on the rock and not upon the person who's sheltering in it. And when the judgment falls upon the ungodly in the days to come, it will not fall upon the Christian because they're sheltering in the rock of Jesus Christ. And all this business about being in Christ and Christ being in us should make us less worldly and more interested in the things that he's interested in. In verse 57, he goes on to speak about our dependence on him. His father had sent him into the world and he'd humbled himself so as to be dependent upon his father. And he lived by his father. When Satan tempted him in the wilderness to turn the stones into bread, he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. In other words, I'm not here to do what I want, but what my father wants. I'm dependent upon him. And so he says here, those who feed on me shall live by me. I will actually keep them going. I will give them the strength to overcome the troubles and the temptations and the setbacks. And they will do what I tell them to do because they know that's what's best for them. You see, living by him means living by what he said. Living our lives according to his teaching. If necessary, changing our lives to be more like his instead of doing what so many people are trying to do today, which is to change Christ to be like them. They want to live a certain way of life and do certain things, so they pretend that that's what Christ would have done. People are all the time trying to change the Christ of the Bible to be like themselves, <clears throat> so they don't feel so bad. Elton John once said that Jesus Christ was a homosexual. 
And that's because he himself is a homosexual. And so instead of changing his life to be like Christ, he changed Christ to be like him. <coughs> Our Lord ends his conversation with these words in verse 58 by summarizing all that he said. Having described himself as the bread of life, he says, this is what the bread which came down from heaven is like. I'm totally different from the bread that your fathers ate in the wilderness, and they're dead, but those who feed on me shall live forever. How repetitious this has been. How repetitious, repetitious the Lord Jesus is in his teaching. This 58th verse is almost the same as the 50th verse, where he also spoke about the bread which came down from heaven, and almost all the verses in between are very similar to each other. And it shows that our Saviour believed in repetition. He believed in saying the thing, same things over and over again. And that's because his teaching was so important. You don't just warn people once that there's alligators in the river. You warn them again and again so they don't jump in. He's actually speaking about the matter of eternal life and death. And it's the same with people who preach God's word today. They will keep on and on saying the same things time and time again because it's so important. Finally, in verse 59, we're told where the conversation had taken place. It was in the synagogue in Capernaum. So he said these wonderful truths in a place of worship. Imagine the privilege of being in that place, not only hearing the greatest truths, but hearing them from the greatest preacher. And yet we know that most of these people rejected his words. You've only got to have a glimpse at the next verse for a moment, which we should look at in detail next week, God willing, to see that many thought that this was a hard saying. It was too hard to understand. It was too hard to take in. And maybe you felt that way this morning. It certainly isn't always easy to comprehend God's word, but whether a person is in a synagogue in Capernaum or whether they're in London, in a church, the main thing is not how much we understand of our Lord's teaching, but whether we realise that in order to be forgiven for our sin, we must come to him and receive him as our saviour. And having done that, we must feed on him for the rest of our lives and seek to become more like him. So may God lighten our darkness and help us not only to understand these things, but to put them into practice. Amen.